it is so um, so less often that we we are able to hear the voices of Palestinians to get a sense of the texture of their lives and what this loss means for um, actual people or communities is um, is something that happens all the time. I think within Palestine, those stories are circulating constantly, um, and yet that world of narration, of listening, of voice is not um, transposed, it's not translated, it's considered somehow non-existent or incommensurable or untranslatable. And that's where the horror continues, right? Because um, these massive bombardments, which are not just a war on Hamas, but they're, a, they're a targeting of, of the entire Palestinian population, um, by proxy. And um, that kind of destruction is um, is already horrific in ways that stretch language, but the fact that in, it is not reported or conveyed um, in the mainstream media means that the loss is in some sense ameliorated or denied, which means that it doesn't exist for the rest of the world. Um, there is grieving for the lives that are lost. There's, there's, there's uh, massive and protracted grieving. That grieving is not seen, right? It's only from the point of view of the media in complicity with the Israeli uh, state and its military operations um, that those, those life worlds are effaced from, from sensory experience. We, we don't see them. We don't hear them. Uh, we're, we can't we can't register that grief, that steadfastness, that community support. In fact, it's the incommensurability between those worlds that is our problem. That's the 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 ethical failure, the political failure of our media world. That 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 distance seems so untraversable uh, between those worlds. In the time that I spent there, when I was allowed to um, pass through the border. You have to enter the state of Israel to get to to, to the West Bank, and uh, I am no longer allowed in. It was extremely important for me to go there and to visit several cities and to talk to people who had undergone enormous loss and how they live with the the sense that bombardment will, uh, well, in Gaza, bombardment will happen again. In the West Bank, people will be stopped. They will be imprisoned. They will be imprisoned for intolerably long times. They will be surveyed. They will be asked to, to betray their closest people. I mean, Netanyahu has uh, reiterated this longstanding rationale for uh, Israeli violence against Palestinians by claiming that Israel is simply exercising uh, self-defense. And um, I gather he went on some major U.S. network, I can't remember if it's 60 Minutes or something else, to claim, um, well, if you were attacked here in the United States, uh, you would defend yourself, and um, why shouldn't Israel do the same? And then claims that um, Israel was attacked unprovoked. <laughs> and this is, of course, after the um, the violence at Sheikh Jarrah and the violence at the Al Aqsa Mosque, which is, as you know, just at the heart of Palestinian life, especially for Palestinians who are Muslim. The first question we have to ask is who has a self that can be defended? Is Palestinian self defense a concept? And would he or the Israeli state allow for Palestinian self defense as a, a right held by Palestinians that? that is legitimate. The problem there, of course, is that the right of self-defense is being invoked by Netanyahu as a right of nation states. And the Palestinians do not have a nation state in the same way. They have an, they have territories that are forcibly and geopolitically divided from each other. They are, they are, they are those who are in the West Bank and Gaza do not have citizenship rights. Those who are within 48 have second-class citizenship rights. There is no uh, established nation state, and in fact, Israel has opposed it. So the, if, 
if the right to self-defense is a right invoked by nation states and Palestinians are not a nation state, then Palestinians never have the right to defend themselves when they are attacked. So here we can see that um, that the, what's, what seems like a rationale given according to international law um, is one that uh, precludes the possibility of Palestinians invoking an equal right to self-defense. They do not have a self, a national self, to be defended under this framework, which is one of the, the problems and limits of international law itself as it's currently formulated. But also, it's obviously uh, the problem that Palestinian political self-determination is something that the state of Israel will not allow, and it will not abide, and it will say that it will not abide by that for reasons of security. So the reason it denies um, legitimate political subject status to Palestinians is self-defense. And there's an, another question here. Um, what kind of self is it that um, uh, enacts such a brutal and genocidal uh, bombing? And I use the word genocide um, with care because this has happened again and again. And um, there are reasons to think that the full liquidation of that population is one of the aims of the Israeli state, and that the only thing that keeps it from liquidating that pos that population is the ob objections of a fairly weak uh, international community. I, I think we have to ask what kind of self is it that inflicts violence of that kind against Palestinian life, um, and that believes its defense uh, requires that overwhelming, brutal uh, form of killing time and again. But also, um, if every act of violence is self-defense, and I, I've never heard of the Israeli state claiming uh, that its acts of violence are not self-defense. I mean, yes, there is a military court, and sometimes they do find excessive violence, and they do even punish it. If, for the most part, all acts of violence on the part of the state are self-defense, then um, and including preemptive forms of violence, then, then its its wars against Palestinian life are always legitimated in advance through this highly flexible and non-reciprocal uh, right. Uh, so it is no right; it's a tactical and nefarious instrumentalization of a right in order to continue a quite bloody and horrific war. I would say we are already imagining when we object, we are already imagining that other world when we, uh, when we claim when we, uh, that it is outrageous the ways in which Palestinian lives are taken or black lives are taken with impunity by militarized police or by explicit bombardments. So I think it's not like we stop and imagine a world anew and start creating from nothing. It's, it's not that. It's rather in the, in the moment of outrage, we are already imagining the alternative. Otherwise, I believe we would not be capable of outrage. <laughs>